All right, I'd like to uh, have a roll call to uh, bring the MCD Board of Supervisors meeting to call to order. Um, Nikki, are you there? Nikki Schultz, present. Kenzie? Kenzie Perry is here. Quirky. Uh, Quirky Carr is here. And uh, Ken Anderton's here, and we're uh, called to order. Any uh, public testimony? None that I'm aware of. I know um, Brian had uh, let a handful of people know about the meeting because of the topic of his presentation. So I know we do have a couple of guests, but I'm not sure if there's anyone here who's planning to uh, make any comments necessarily. So welcome to our guests. Great, welcome. All right, looks like uh, if there's no public testimony, we have contract approvals. Nick, do we have any contracts to approve? No contracts to approve today, sir. You've been very easy the last two board meetings I've attended, so thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, looks like item D on the agenda, FEMA funded seismic study. Brian, you're on. Thanks, Ken. And Emily, do you mind pulling up the PDF for me? Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, currently on vacation, so Emily's helping me um, with being able to navigate the slides. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Everhart, and I'm a project manager at MCD. Um, I also manage our emergency management program, so I'm really interested in things like hazard mitigation, um, emergency response, that type of thing. Um, currently, I'm leading a project that got kicked off in July looking at our pump station number one, um, seismic stability, and to better understand our risk um, within the districts. So Emily, can you go to the next slide for me? Yeah, so what we're gonna do is because we do have a few people that are outside of our normal um, normal folks, I'm gonna go a little bit of overview of who the districts are and where we're located, and then take a look at our seismic risk across the four districts. And then I'm gonna talk about the project that I'm managing um, our pump station one, and then talk about what this project might mean for the future and, and future studies. So uh, next slide. All right, so briefly for those who might not be super familiar with us, um, I work for MCDD. We have uh, four districts that we manage um, by contracts, Pen 1 to the West, Pen 2, MCDD is the largest in the middle, and then SDIC. We're located um, kind of along the south shore of the Columbia River, um, along the historic floodplain. We managed uh, 27 miles of, of levy and uh, about 12 pump stations um, behind those levees. Today we're going to focus on MCDD specifically, but I think this is a good graph for understanding kind of how we fit into the overall region. Um, this is a, an image that shows um, kind of our, our liquefaction potential in a Cascadia subduction zone event of 9.0. Um, so this is based on Dogami's study in 2018, and as you can see, our districts being kind of located along the river as well as you know the areas to our west are definitely more susceptible than the rest of our, our region around us are. And this is a liquefaction potential. So liquefaction being where the soil becomes like liquid and moves and settles like liquid would. Um, next slide. This is a, a look at what liquefaction could do to our ground and how it might change it permanently or not. The idea being that, as I understand it, I'm not, I'm not an expert in, in seismic risk, but um, when something moves, does it go back to where it was or does it, does it change and, and kind of no longer be what it, what it had been before? And as you can see, MCDD, as well as the districts, especially to the west, are very susceptible to ground deformation from liquefaction. Um, so this is a little bit staggering when I first saw this. If you look at the rest of Portland in general, um, it's just the areas along the river that are really susceptible to this. So um, next slide. Looking a little closer to home, there's also a fault within Portland, kind of, as I understand it, near like Forest Park area for those that are kind of closer by. And in case of a, a 6.8 earthquake there, which has historically happened, um, you know, we have a bit of a larger regional impact. So this is a look at overall damage potential. It's a little bit of a different scale and, and focus, but basically what would people perceive as shaking or damage potential? And, as you can see, MCDD is definitely in the high range to the very high range, depending on where you look exactly. So a bit staggering, um, and I don't want to say that SDIC is off the hook here. They're still above average of the rest of the region around it. But you know, we have, I guess my takeaway is that when I saw this, I was like, we 
we are going to have um, big impacts on our levee system, on our operations and how we do business if we have a Cascadia or a Portland Fault um, earthquake. So maybe interested in what can we do about it? You know, it's one thing to, to know the problem. It's another to actually take action towards making a difference related to it. Next slide, if you don't mind. All right, so this is where we're gonna to focus today on our pilot study related to uh, pump station one. It's that green dot, if you can see it, um, surrounded by the blue in that kind of Southwest corner of MCDD and just across from Penn to Southeast corner. Next slide. All right, so what we don't know is really how will our pump stations function post earthquake? What we do know right now without doing any additional studies is that if you look at, you know, um, sewer or water pump stations in our in the valley or the Willamette Valley. There's an estimate in the Oregon Resilience Plan that we'll have between one month or one year where these pump stations are down. And I would say, and I'm not an expert in this, so I'd love to talk to somebody who is more, you know, if there's 100 pump stations down in the region, I think that it might take longer for some of them to, to recover. So I really, um, I would look at this as like a conservative estimate of how long some of the pump stations could be down, depending on how they were built, when they were built, how much they thought about, you know, seismic resiliency ahead of time. We also know that earthquakes could lead to flooding through other aspects around the pump stations. Structure itself might degrade, but the levees might change and shift and that, and that could definitely cause challenges for the pump station. Uh, liquefaction um, might deform how the water gets to our pump stations. It might also impact how the water gets out of our pump stations, if, even if it were to get to our pump stations. So there's a lot um, of things that are going on here at the same time. And we just don't quite know what's going on. So we wanted to get a better sense of what, what, what are we really up against and how bad it would it really be for us. Next slide, if you don't mind. All right, so I'm leading a project that uh, FEMA Region 10 funded. Um, really appreciate them investing in us getting to, and, and kind of getting to explore this topic with us of kind of cascading hazards and earthquake causing flooding and, and vice versa. Um, so this study looks specifically at just pump station one. Pump station one is one of our larger pump stations um, within the districts. Um, it's one of our critical ones. If it goes down, um, you know, we have challenges getting the water out. So we're looking at assessing and quantifying two elements in this study. And there's some things that are not included within the study that I'll share in a minute. It's going to look at the ground the pump station, how would it perform, uh, how it meets, and then the structure above the ground and, and how those interact. And I do have Chris Carpenter here um, from Cornforth Consultants if there are any specific questions on how the study is being done. Um, but so we're looking at those two elements. We're then hoping to identify a couple of potential mitigation concepts. Say, okay, well, here's how bad the risk is. Well, what can we do about it? Um, and, and then start to look at how much would it cost to actually take those actions and what would that maybe buy us as far as um, reducing the level of risk to our system. And hopefully that those information will help us to better inform our decisions about what we do next. So this is really just a pilot to get to know, you know, what is our system going to do? How's it going to perform? And what could we do about it, if anything? And uh, if we can't do anything about it, what do we do? Um, what do we start planning for instead? Next slide. All right, so this project does not include the following. Uh, it's a pretty small, you know, overall budget, it's about $50,000. Um, it doesn't look at our operational adjustments we could make, doesn't look at early warning systems, things that might help us to automate our operations or pump stations. It doesn't look at our trash rakes, debris grates, outfalls, or utilities, the things that are outside the pump station itself. It doesn't look at other pump stations. Um, it also doesn't look at, you know, if we invest this amount of money, then we're going to save this amount of money in, in cost or damages. Um, and it doesn't look at all in the levies. So it's, it's a really focused, narrow project, and I imagine it will probably uh, raise more questions than answers, but I think that's an okay place to be at for where we're at. Uh, next slide. The project's pretty short in timeline overall. Um, took about a year to get the project going and, you know, grants start up and, and procurement and those things. But we, uh, working with Cornforth Consultants, who's done a lot of our levy investigation work, um, did a kickoff in July. And we're kind of like currently underway doing the kind of data analysis and seismic stability analysis to then lead us towards in the fall doing some mitigation concepts, um, brainstorming, and then drafting the report. We hope to have a final report this winter, and then I plan to bring back to the MCDD board and the public in general, whoever's interested, the results of our study. Next slide. So what I don't know is what's gonna happen after we get the results um, in this. A couple of different possibilities or avenues where this might go. 
we might say, great, let's let's make an investment. And that's obviously the board's decision, but we'll make recommendations. Let's make an investment in our system and, and start planning to, to make retrofits to our building. Um, looks like a good investment financially. It might say also, okay, well, now we know this. We also want to know about what would happen to the um, area outside of the building, to the outfalls or the, or the trash rakes or the debris grates. It might lead us to saying, this is going to be too expensive to invest in. Let's focus our energy instead on rebuilding after the earthquake. In the meantime, having some temporary mitigation options. So how do we get that water moving if this pump station is down for a year? What, what do we do? Like, how do we keep functioning and draining the land so that people can recover? Or it could also just change and impact our seismic design. So we might say, okay, well, when we do replace a pump station, we're going to have a higher standard and keep working on you know, replacing with better than what we have right now. And that might be our focus. So these are some possibilities. I'm, I'm curious what the board has to think and if there's any questions, but that's kind of my overview. And um, yeah, thanks for the chance to, to meet with you today. No, last slide. Actually, I kind of like that last one for kind of helping people see where it could go. Emily, if you don't mind going back to 11. All right. Yeah, any, any questions from the board or from the public? Um, Brian, <laughs> Brian, this is fantastic to oh, thank you. give it an overview and we really appreciate the forward thinking and, and looking into seismic risks because it we discussed a little bit about this in the SDIC board meeting and that there's so much infrastructure, not just airports, there's, you know, the power grid, uh, the, the, the uh, local, the regional national natural gas pipeline mm -hmm. runs through a trip in SDIC and right. all the different substations and all the political power administration uh, substations and they all work as a system. So um, it, it's really important for us to, to figure out, you know, what is going to happen as much as we can and to try to prepare for it or have plans to address it if it, it does get damaged. So I'll open it up to the rest of the board for questions. I just wanted to, you know, personally thank you for all your hard work on this. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Hi, Brian, I've got a question. Excuse me, I've got some equipment that's making funny sounds. Oh, good. I'm in a room front by bunk beds, so we're good. <laughs> Um, I've got uh, two questions. One okay. technical. It said for the ground deformation, deformation, there's a high potential for ground deformation. Can you quantify that just in approximately what scale are we talking about a ground deformation of, you know, we come back a foot, we're we talking about an inch. What's that high mean? That's a great question. And I don't have a, a confident answer to give you. Um, I think I took this from the natural hazard mitigation planning effort that I'm working on, and I, I haven't um, dove into all of like what does I look at it as colors right now to me it's like it's bad. I'll, that's what I know is it's bad, but I don't I can't quantify how bad is for you, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. I, I can try to get that answered back to you, though, in the future. So. Yeah, I, I, I suspect that that's not something that's that's specifically quantifiable, but um, but it's just it's a it, it might be it just yeah it's not like specifically part of the study, but I think it could be useful information. So I'm interested in that too. Yeah, and there was just a um, study done on, I saw on the Port of Portland property okay. with um, Armin student line down at OSU where they did some quantification on that. Yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, then my other question is, um, this was funded by a grant. Yes. Uh, and yeah. Curious what, how, how many dollars are associated with that grant and if there's other um, opportunities like that to look at other parts of our system. Definitely. Yeah. Let me tell a little bit about the journey of how we got the grant. I think that might be helpful. I'm just seeing if anyone else is on this call from FEMA Region 10 because they might have more information too, but I can't quite tell. Um, so I, I actually pitched this idea to FEMA Region 10 through the Cooperating Technical Partners or CTP. Uh, we have gotten funding from them before for Leverity Columbia, I understand, to do some of our public outreach work. And so I, I had worked with um, Carrie Cinnamon, who's my manager, to kind of pitch um, a couple of ideas, as well as Kevin Severson, who's my, my project sponsor, to say, well, what if we did every pump station um, that kind of pumps out of our system? So not just the internal ones, but all the external ones. Um, I, so I pitched that alongside pump station one. And they said, well, we have enough funding to do pump station one, but we can't do all six of them or whatever I end up asking for. Um, 
but I could see that uh, potentially, I mean, obviously the coordination with Re New Region 10 and how this project goes and what we find for, okay, we, we learned this, we still really wanna know this now. And I think the goal of it for them is to not just to help us know our risk, but to do something about it. So like, I think their motivation is, okay, well, if we're gonna study this, like, is there a likelihood of you doing a future grant for hazard mitigation to actually invest in the system? Um, that's my understanding of it at least, so. But yes, there is, and you know, I'm actively working on that for a project in Pen One right now as well for for PIR pump station. So, um, so yes, there's there is, and that's something that's kind of um, partially in my wheelhouse right now. So I, I would be interested in exploring that more with them. And and just for your information, uh, there is a building resilient infrastructure and communities program through FEMA that. Congress is looking to appropriate some funding to, and we're uh, talking to our federal lobbyist about just monitoring that and looking for any opportunities we can to apply for additional support. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Yeah, definitely. There are funds, and I think there's more funding than I've ever seen in the time I've been at MCD, the last six years at least, that's been kind of focused on look, looking forward and reducing our hazards ahead of time. So, Any other uh, questions or um, from board members or um, things you'd like to see in the future about this um, or from the public? Can you hear me? I can, I'm not sure who you are, but I'm gonna look down. Uh, do you know, oh. can you identify yourself? Oh, good, this is Nancy. Hi, Nancy. This is Nancy. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I phoned in, so I have very little Zoom, uh, whatever, I'm just on a phone call. <laughs> so, um, so, Brian, yeah, I agree. This is really cool. I like, I think that um, being forward looking, especially when it comes to prevention is really cost effective. So, um, and I came in partway through your presentation, but could you, so you may have addressed this, but could you, um, there are connections to like Nikki was pointing out all the different infrastructure throughout our um, system. And I know the port I think the port has done a bunch of seismic um, studies, particularly in terms of how the runways will fare. Right. When we looked at this, when we were working with Dogami, mm -hmm. um, we the all the we would get lots of questions about, hey, can we figure out what about a high water event and a seismic event of mm -hmm. the levees? Sure. So I guess you're talking. You're the, this is focus on pump stations, but I'm also wondering, like, how does it compare to both the levees and the runways as two of our very important disaster uh, infrastructure pieces regionally? Yeah, so I'll speak briefly, Nancy, to what this study, it's the specifics of this study don't cover the levees. Um, it's uh, okay, not, that's what I I think it's important, but it is, it is a pretty narrow focus. It's a pilot project just on pump station one. Um, I did invite Alex Howard, who I think is on the call um, from the Port of Portland, um, who I believe is working on resilience actions related to these types of things. Alex, do you have anything you want to share? You don't have to. I know I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, but uh, I yeah, um, yeah, sure. I, I was just about to read a chat in here that we do have the seismic analyses for the runway, which I think would be good to consider um, in this work, and we can share those with you. We have the research that was done by the OSU team but also work that was also done by GRI that looked at um, the effects of liquefaction on both our broad runways. Um, part of this, we used that as the reasoning for figuring out which of the runways we wanna mitigate. So the South runway is where we're focusing and it's um, 6,000 feet of the Eastern portion of the South runway. So we have all of that information that can go into this analysis and we think it will be very, think it'll be very helpful. So happy to share that. Thank you. Yeah, and Great. we do have, um, pour and forth on the line too, and, and they've been collecting both information about um, what we have related to the structure, but uh, in addition to that, you know, looking at other studies that might have relevance to our study. Um, like I said, it's a pretty small project, so um, there might be things that we don't get to fully tap into and want to explore further after the end of the project. So, um, but thank you for, for sharing that and for asking. Brian, is there one entity, or maybe this is FEMA that's looking at this area uh, this is the most prone to uh, liquefaction um, impacts that will stream together all the different, you know, disparate work products of research uh, to figure out where the gaps are you know, that they need to be covered. Um, yeah. I'm not aware of that. I know that the people I'm working with at the Energy Attention, I don't think are on the call, so like, hopefully I'm speaking accurately. Um, 
hadn't really explored this concept because they focused primarily on flooding. So a lot of this is tying it back to flooding um, was what their main interest was. Um, but I know that they're interested in the results of it. And, and so I'm not sure if, if anyone from the outside, I know Bill Steele is here from UW, I believe. Um, if anyone knows of who's collecting that data, I'm certainly interested and happy to have that resource shared around, so. Um, I can jump in. So I've been in conversations with, um, this is Alex Howard again from the court. Um, I've been in conversations with Amanda Syak, who is the coordinator at FEMA 10 reason around the uh, seismic preparedness as we started looking at the brick grant process as well. We can connect on all of that and try to build these pieces together. I do think that this is um, one of the benefits of having both Brian, um, so MCDD, of course, participate in the Multnomah County Natural Housing Mitigation Planning effort, because this is the forum where we can bring all these different pieces together and start to, to tell that story of what are all the seismic improvements that we're looking at doing in this region. So mm -hmm. that's that's probably a good place. There's not one agency that I'm aware of that we can get all together. The Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization, um, which just had our one of our, um, I think, roughly every six weeks calls today to do some updates. We, we try to coordinate around those different topics. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to tell a better story about this, which is the same thing that Mr. Middaw brought up in our um, about a week ago about how to tell the story of resilience in the region. So I think we've got some work to do around that, but lots of opportunities. Yeah, thanks Alex for sharing. Uh, I might mention that um, earthquake early warning is, is supported or earthquake early warning triggered mitigation actions are supported by FEMA and a number of different programs. So something to consider perhaps next time is, is there efficacy in integrating earthquake early warning into your planning for the last minute kind of mitigations? I know spinning down a large centri centrifuge pumps can uh, dramatically reduce the load on the bolts holding them down and, and protect equipment. So yeah. something to consider. Definitely, thank you, Bill. And thanks for coming. Um, yeah, the idea of kind of automation by knowing the earthquake is coming, turning something off or slowing something down before the earthquake hits definitely are things I think we want to explore after this project. Unfortunately, it's not within the scale of it right now, but sure. I know that we need to look beyond this. This is just kind of like our first dip of our toes into it, if you will. So, but I, I think there's definitely interest, you know, in exploring beyond that. So I'm hoping that it, it spurs and catalyzes additional uh, in, interest in investigation. Great. Yeah, Brian, good work, good work on this. Any other questions? One quick comment. I, I'd be interested in the future to learn more about how you plan to measure the effectiveness of the various mitigation strategies that you identify. But I understand that's a uh, that would take place after this specific yeah. project. Perfect. Yeah, no, I think that's necessary, especially if we were to pursue any grant funding we'd be able to have to measure like, what is the benefit cost ratio, right? We don't, we won't have the, the benefit ratio, we'll have the cost portion of it, you know, to say like, we're looking at, oh, it's the $2 million investment. How much, are, how much risk are we buying down really? And right now that won't be quantified in the study, but I think it should be if we want to keep going down that route. So yeah, thank you, Kenzie. And it'd also be interesting, Kenzie, if we understood the utilities plans around seismic resiliency as well. So. If there's anyone, anyone in PG would want to come talk to MCDD, that'd be, that'd be great. Absolutely, happy to make that connection. Agreed, the more coordination, the better. And if anyone wants to reach out or connect me to other people too, I'm I'm happy to, to try to invite them to things and just keep the conversation rolling, that would be great, so. Great. Well, if there's no other questions, we'll go up to the other exciting topic. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Thank we're going to talk about uh, item number E, PMLS cost sharing and funding options. Uh, Mark, you're on. Actually, I'm going to kick us off really quickly. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Evan Mitchell, uh, Public Affairs and Communications Manager. And um, we had hoped to have our consultant, Jamie Damon, here to kind of help facilitate and guide the conversation, but her daughter gave birth this morning uh, and doesn't sound like it's going all that well. So um, we are sending lots of good healing thoughts to Jamie and her family right now. Um, but we wanted to come back, we're, we're making the rounds with the individual boards 
this month to come back to talk to y'all about the PMLS project and the um, cost allocation methodologies that were discussed last month. Um, Mark is going to kind of run us through what we talked about last month and what we heard from you all. A number of you had questions um, and thoughts that, that you wanted us to apply. Uh, just for sort of the bigger framing, kind of reminder of where we are. Uh, actually, I think Jim's gonna do some of that. I'm, I'm gonna cut into the, so actually that's what I'm gonna do first. I'm gonna turn- Feel free, to Evan, you've got this if you want to. No, it's okay. I will turn it over to you because you're doing the most important framing and then I'll, I'll tack on. So Jim, take it away. Okay, let's advance the slide once. Um, I am here because we were practicing this presentation a little bit and just informing me of, of what the plan was. And it dawned on me that we often forget because we're with a bunch of subject matter experts to remind ourselves why we're here. And so uh, if really important to me, we just came off of a disaster preparedness around seismic, but there's some other disasters that we need to be prepared for. So if we could uh, advance this slide, I just wanted to show you a brief history that flooding really does happen in MCDD and the other associated districts. And you can see that over time, we've had a number of flood events. And we know from recent experience in other countries and even here in the United States that the weather is changing and we're likely to see even more heavy rainfall events. So if we could advance the slide again. One more, this is a picture of Vanport in 1948. And let's just do one more. This was 1996. You can see the shipping channel for the port looks very broad here, not always good. And then one more. Uh, this is just this summer from Germany. And again, really historic, unprecedented rainfall events. And they've been happening in Washington DC and other places around the world. So. We're going into a conversation about cost allocation for a preliminary engineering and design study, but that study is just one piece of a comprehensive effort that began over a decade ago to really upgrade and modernize our system to prevent the kinds of things that you see in these pictures. And for us, it's really important that we get the details right and who pays how much and who benefits and so on is critically important to building the public support we need to move forward. But fundamentally, as a team of people working on this, we are really all about winning a 65% return on our small 33% investment in an overall modernization of our system. So while we sweat the details, I want us to be grounded in the fact that our system really needs upgrading. And in the absence of investment, that upgrade isn't gonna happen. And collectively, we're accountable to the people we serve for finding the resources we need to take care of all of us. And so I just wanted to start with that. We're here for a really important reason, which is to keep people safe. We're talking about $5 million total. And again, we need to get that right. And the details matter, but the big picture also matters. And I think as people who are subject matter experts, we sometimes don't put enough focus on remembering the big picture. So that's the end of my speech. And now we can get into how we're gonna get this work done. And I'm confident that together we're gonna to figure it out. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the board. One last thing, uh, we did have the major general from Washington DC out about 10 days ago, uh, along with their local colonel from the Northwest district. And we did a tour of our facilities and we had the excellent core team with us. And the tour went exceptionally well. Our, your staff did an amazing job building the details into the investigation. And that uh, product is about to be signed as soon as tomorrow. Uh, and what was most fulfilling to me is we had set up time after the tour for the major general to ask questions because we thought, hey, he's a tough guy. We knew he had hard questions, but he didn't even need to have that follow-on briefing because he said, you guys have done an exceptional job uh, MCDD and the rest of the districts are exactly the partners we want to be working with at the Corps of Engineers, and he's very optimistic that we're going to be successful winning federal investment in our system. And so we're really excited that we're going to get that chief's report signed tomorrow, and your team did a great job, and now let's get to work and, and keep our share of the investment moving, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Thanks, Jim. Um... So yes, we are really excited about uh, the, the final, this final step in the feasibility study process. Essentially what will happen after the general 
uh, or after the signing of the chief's report is we are really going to start preparing for, for the pre-engineering and design phase uh, on one side of, of on one side of it we'll be focused on getting authorized getting the funding you know making sure that we're we're moving forward at the federal level to keep this thing on track and make sure that it keeps moving forward at the pace we've been, been discussing and then at home we'll be talking about um, what we actually do during TED and how we're going to pay for it and working through some of those things. And so we've um, hopefully not too often given you various presentations on what that process is going to look like, what that work is going to be. And the cost allocation piece is really important, um, but we don't need to make a decision right away. I think that was the big thing that I wanted to emphasize for you all today is we have until you know, assuming everything goes on schedule in the way we want it to we have until early next early next spring to make a decision. So, you know, these are complicated, tough things to work through, but the the need to make a very specific decision about which cost allocation methodology we use is not, you know, right on top of us. We've got a little bit of time. We've got we've got an opportunity to work through this stuff and to really think about it. And um, I think with that, Mark, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the funding, some of the funding options that we're looking at, which we think will help sort of ground some of this cost allocation discussion and how we end up parsing out who pays for what. Great, thanks, Evan. And thanks, Jim, um, for setting the stage here. Um, the first item we're going to talk about is going to be a little bit more detailed, um, I should say, or a little bit more new material than um, our previous presentations. So this is sort of the new stuff, and then I'll review the um, things that we talked about. Um, so potential revenue options, we haven't talked at length about this. Um, it is important to know that staff is looking at all the options. So, um, and um, the goal is for obviously to find options that minimize the impact to the various districts and figure out what's right for each district. So it, for each district, it could be a combination of things. That said, um, one of the first things that I'm gonna talk about is the state levy grant fund. And that option, um, it, it might do a pretty good job um, of addressing a lot of our PED commitments. Um, there is a new state levy grant fund through Business Oregon that is being developed and um, will be available estimated about April of 2023. And it provides for grants up to $2 million per biennium um, with a local match. So that, that obviously from the numbers that we've um, broadcast previously, which is a total of five, 5.6, million dollars for our cost share for PED um, if each district is con uh, considered individually and they all rate a grant, um, compete for a grant successfully, then that could obviously take the lion's share. Um, we're gonna talk about assessments. Um, previously, we socialized the facts that, um, so we sort of had um, Casey, the budget manager, uh, look at, the, the feasibility of using assessments to address uh, the PED commitments. And he looked at the range of allocation scenarios and determined that um, three of the four districts had the capability of, of funding PED um, by increasing assessments at 10% a year, which most of you know is, is sort of the ongoing rate. And um, over the past few years, that's sort of been the standard um, sort of ceiling for raising assessments. And we certainly don't want to continue to do that indefinitely for our landowners, but um, at that same rate, we could fund PED. Um, another option was brought up yesterday, which isn't shown here. I'm just using the same slides for everyone, but a good point was made. We sort of had thought this was sort of packed into one of these other categories, or maybe it was just in others. But um, obviously, one of the one of the other things that um, follows without using a, a financing method um, is um, just partner partner contributions. And, and so we haven't really talked about that. And that box will 
um, be added to the mix. But there's obviously you know, some of our state and local partners um, could choose to assist us with with PED. So that's that's up for discussion. Um, the last, well, there's three three final options. Kind of, um, I'll I'll jump to ahead to reserves. This different districts, similar to assessments, different districts have different capabilities, and in terms of reserves, different districts have uh, differing abilities to contribute reserves to the mix. And it is possible that not one solution fits for every every district, and that sort of a, a hybrid um, or a mixture of of these various options will will be chosen. So again, there's still time to deliberate which options are best. But the final two options. Um, are public and private loans. Now, public loans you're familiar with, um, look at examples like the Business Oregon IFA, Special Public Works Fund you see up there. Um, public loans do require backing of uh, partners similar to the LRC IFA loans. So, um, and then there's private loans. And there's sort of a, well, we can talk more in the future about the pros and cons of these as we continue to investigate them. Um, well, I will say that you know uh, private loans they ha they um, are sort of what we're considering as one of our last options um, because of their complexity and because of the um, some of the challenges we may face uh, in terms of the structuring alone with districts transitioning to a new district potentially and you know other factors. Um, so they, they're a little more complicated and and obviously a grant is always preferred to a loan. Um, or existing funding and revenues preferred to financing. However, that being said, we all know that our, our interest rates are historically low rates right now. And so uh, the return on investment for um, potentially using an option like this is, um, is pretty high. So it's, it's, we're not dismissing it outright. And um, you know, we're taking feedback on all these potential options to see which, um, which, which seem most attractive to which boards. So, um, Evan, anything else to add? Anything I didn't cover on that? Okay. No, I, I think I think you hit the majority of it. You all will remember doing the capital loan last year um, for MCDB, uh, the various complications and and the response um, of banks. You know what we know about private loans is that. Um, we, we can't bank on the new revenue option uh, as you know the the thing the banks are going to look at what we have now. While MCBB is in probably the best position to seek loans, we do have the other districts to to consider, and so it may be that we're looking at a whole combination of different tools as well as we think about what the different districts can bear. Thanks. Uh, okay, so I don't see any hands raised, and we'll have, obviously have an opportunity to discuss at the end. I'll uh, go into my review of our cost allocation methodologies. Um, our goal is to bludgeon you with these different options until we have a good thorough discussion and everyone feels comfortable knowing some of the things that we've come up with, as well as um, perhaps these discussions could fuel um, any other ideas for some tweaks, modifications, or things that we, we haven't considered. But I think we've put our thinking caps on pretty uh, pretty tightly um, and come up with some options for you. So um, these are the leading methods. As you recall, we had leading methods and we had sort of reference methods, which I'll discuss next. But these are some of the ones we thought that did the best job of balancing um, benefits received and costs incurred. And um, the first method is just using a pure economic benefits um, method, and that is based on the um, based on the extensive um, economic benefits analysis that was conducted during the feasibility study. Um, the the other composite options usually use some combination of economic benefit or the project cost or the PED cost, which the, the allocations are very slightly different, but they're roughly the same as the overall project costs by district. Um, and one of the composites here uses, um, uh, we actually use sort of shared costs um, 
to, to kind of further break it down. In some cases, we could apply shared costs equally among the districts or use another metric. So um, we kind of talked about these and I think we included the last, last month's memo from the format in your packet for, for reference in July format. So um, we'll go into reference, me reference methods. And again, we wanted to show you all, all of these because we think that um, obviously we are, we have some traditional allocation methods that we're used to thinking in those terms. And we talked last month about how some of those are very helpful as reference points, but they may not reflect uh, actual costs or benefits received. And then we have metrics and more, more complicated metrics and information that kind of tune those numbers up a bit. Um, for instance, acreage is kind of a good surrogate for benefits received, but um, we had done some work on replacement values through the um, HAZIS um, modeling data. And then when we did, when the core came along, we went the next step and went to an even more sophisticated method for parsing out benefits received. So um, that's why these find ourselves in the reference methods, but we currently don't suggest perhaps that, um, that those are the leading methods. So, um, so these are some of the previous methods. And here's the table sort of laid out with, with all the percentages. You know, recall we also came up with some other ways of presenting these to try to help you visualize them as being the most simple. So um, now I wanna go over briefly what we heard in July um, from the various boards. Um, and I'm gonna kind of jump just really quickly. We just showed you all the methodologies, the reference methods, as well as the, um, the sort of leading methods. And we heard loud and clear that you wanted them all displayed so that they could be available for reference and comparison. So we, we intend to do that. We're not, we're not narrowing anything down prematurely. Um, we'll have full access to those numbers. Um, there was a discussion about consideration for deferred maintenance. And um, I think we, when, when, the, when the dust settled and we reconsidered the, those questions, we, um, we realized that maybe answered, I answered a little bit prematurely. Um, and that it's, it's important to, to keep in mind that the nature of the projects selected by the core, by core policy, the plan formulation doesn't actually allow for projects that are sort of considered deferred maintenance, deferred O&M in nature. And so we sort of assume that, um, um, so, so all the projects that were selected aren't, aren't really attributed to that. In fact, um, in Pen 1, uh, the PIR pump station was initially considered, but the Corps um, project review at higher levels kicked that one back as um, for, for multiple reasons, but one reason was that it, it looked more like a deferred maintenance project. Um, so the projects that were selected were not deferred maintenance. We, we sort of think of some of some projects that look like that, but actually aren't would be, for example, the, the railroad embankment looks kind of um, is that a deferred maintenance project? No, that was actually a project that the Corps handed over to us and it was sort of unsatisfactory when they, when they created it and, and handed it over to us. Similarly, we found problems in um, SDIC with the pump station. You know, over time, it was, it was discovered that the working elevations really didn't, didn't work out very well. And so when, when the pump station is rebuilt for other reasons, they're also gonna change the working operational elevations um, and, and finally, we have sections of levee that may, may have been built too steep, too narrow. Um, their seepage characteristics with modern modeling prove them to be not up to standard. And so those weren't the fault of, uh, of the districts that, in, that were received those projects from the core. And so that is a long explanation, but hopefully um, it helps, helps understand that um, deferred maintenance isn't necessarily a pro or a con for any particular district in any particular project selections. Um, okay, third item here is the concern about potentially setting a precedent um, by just by selecting a particular cost allocation methodology for PED. 
And, and obviously, I just want to stress that um, you, you all are policymakers. Um, when you make a decision, you can inject language that uh, states the intent of that decision. And um, certainly one allocation method that may be appropriate for PED isn't necessarily appropriate for general construction. Um, you know, in, in, a, in our case, in our situation, we, we possibly may be operating under the new urban flood safety water quality district by then. So it may all be, it may all be moot by then, but regardless, um, you, we can certainly craft language in the decision materials that um, outline the expectations behind uh, your decision and future expectations. So um, we, we don't, staff doesn't recommend that we, we get to um, go down that road where we think that we're sort of making a, a dangerous precedent or setting a precedent. Um, there were questions about authorities and spending limits. And those questions um, were primarily focused on, well, they were brought up by Sandy Drainage Improvement Company. And those were, those discussions are ongoing. Um, staff and legal did research on, um, on that, that subject matter. Um, looked at looked at our um, guiding documents, and um, we did find that the authorities were uh, there was authority to spend outside a physical district if the benefits received were within the district. Um, and we can certainly answer more questions or go further into that, but um, we didn't hear that question from from you, so we're we're happy to speak more to that. But. Um, I'll, I'll save further discussion until I get to the last of these. And, and just to be clear for the MCDD board, there's more conversations to be had with the SDIC board on that and we're working through it. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Okay, finally, um, we, we heard board members raise some questions um, since we were talking so much about economic benefits being so exhaustive, um, exhaustively calculated and um, folks kind of wanted to see behind the curtain um, a little more, and of course, um, the the, the if you pull back the curtain, you can study uh, the appendix to the economic benefits um, or the economics section of the feasibility study. Um, but that's that's not a pleasant task for most of you. So, um, in some of our other board meetings, we did get feedback that maybe maybe we um, uh, if we can start with some sort of synopsis of the economics economic benefits um, formulation. Um, calculations and just a, a high level summary and see if folks have an appetite to hear more. But um, uh, yeah, and then along those same lines, um, it was brought up, where is life loss modeling in, in all of this? Um, we taught, we focused so heavily on the national economic damages model and, and you know, the economic benefits or da property damages avoided. And we don't, we haven't spoken so much to life loss modeling. Um, and life loss modeling is, I won't say it's a new thing for the core, but the sophistication of the modeling that they use um, is more sophisticated and it, it um, tr basically translates um, information from uh, local experts like PBAM or um, County Office of Emergency Management. And so it, it um, provides that information, plugs that information on flood safety notifications and critical vulnerable populations. And it dovetails that in with hydraulic modeling to, to find out um, truly where the life loss can occur during different times of day and other such things. So there's a lot packed into that. And we're also happy to do, um, to do a, a summary of that and see how much appetite there is beyond that to learn more. So uh, any feedback on that whether whether those would be sufficient for your purposes or if you would like us to come to board presentation or other format and just do an in, informational to to hear more and and take you know crack open those documents a little bit and see some of the the numbers and some of the methods behind them some of the members of the pen 2 board raised uh opportunities to have conversations with uh, constituents or stakeholders and wanted some additional help with some of those conversations. So if you're getting questions from people you know, 
uh, or people you represent as in your board role and you'd like a staff member to join you for a coffee or a phone call or a Zoom to help break into some of the details, we'd be more than happy. Just let us know and, and we'll have your back. Okay. I, I guess I'd also add just there that um, we don't really anticipate that a lot of people are going to want to get into the nitty gritty of uh, cost allocation. We're lucky when people recognize there's one drainage district, let alone four. So, um, but certainly we want to, you know, the PMLS and the study itself when it comes out and there's been constituents who've been involved all, all along the way. So definitely um, want to be of assistance there. Uh, so moving forward, I don't want us to just focus on the potential, you know, topics and presentations. Um, we're hoping that we can hear from you and kind of where where your minds are at today. If you have additional questions, um, if there are topics that that either don't feel fully flushed out, but, um, or if there's anything about the cost allocation methods that uh, is rising to the surface for you right now, jump on in. This is Nancy. I um, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. It's just my phone says that I'm muted, so I'm just confused. So I'm glad you can hear me. So, just quickly about the what you were talking about before the economic benefits. What I think would be useful for me is to have just a synopsis. I definitely do not want to get into the nitty gritty of the kinds of things that the economic benefits count, because I was looking on here and there was a replacement value. I'm like, well, what's the difference between replacement value and economic benefits? Sounds like there's an interesting story there. So that, and then also I think the Army Corps rated things, you know, cost per economic benefit or whatever uh, metrics they used. It would be nice to say how that is the same or different than their economic benefits. And I'm talking like, you know, for the lay person, it's like, here's your general thing. So a short synopsis, if it's possible. I, I think it's possible. Um, yeah, so uh, basically the, when we talked about replacement or, value. So Mark, oh. I mean, we can do it now, or you could, you know, send us a couple of bullet points later. Yeah. Cause I, I sure. think uh, it's just a follow-up item, I think. Yeah, I mean, in, in, yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Um, in just in a general nutshell, uh, some things just basically calculate the replacement of the buildings. The feasibility study went beyond replacement of the buildings and their contents, and it um, looked at disruptions to commerce, so transportation disruptions, rail reroutes, um, and and other things like that. And then sometimes we looked at critical infrastructure and added those costs in so that it was more accurate than just taking a building inventory and looking at it at face value. So hopefully that's a true nutshell, but we can, we can kind of itemize a few of what, what those commerce things, um, those additional factors were and um, just give you a, a high level synopsis. Yeah, that would be great. That's an excellent start. Thank you. And Nancy, I had the benefit of listening to this twice. Uh, so uh, it's getting better every time I listen to it. Uh, <laughs> one thing I just wanted to repeat that I mentioned in the SDIC board meeting was, uh, you know, ensuring that in future analysis or analysis is that that critical infrastructure is, is um, that is weighed correctly because uh, I don't want to speak, speak for Kenzie for PG, but I know for Bonneville Power Administration and Civic Corps, there's huge economic uh, damages for disruption. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that those are calculated in that because there's some really critical infrastructure within the entire district. Uh, besides the, you know, the airports and all, all that, there's some critical uh, systems that run through this, the, the drainage basin, so. Yeah. And and just uh, since the SDAC board had the had the benefit of the of, of the answer, I'll try to give an, a, a nutshell answer to that. Also, um, 
Yeah, and those critical systems are what the core has held up for their higher level commands as reasons why this is so important um, beyond just, um, you know, just, just beyond the, the, the hard numbers, they've cited some of that critical infrastructure. And so we definitely tried to make sure that we captured that as best as possible. Um, and there may be opportunities in the future to do uh, a refresh. Um, I, we certainly will 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 do what we can to see um, if we can if we can go down that road if it's necessary. For for instance, especially if if um, there's a lag in um, in authorization, hopefully not. But if this process goes on and we need to tighten the numbers and squeeze more um, out of the turnip, so to speak, we'll we'll do that to tighten those numbers up. Thanks, Mark. Any okay. additional questions? Well, they're letting you off easy today, Mark. I know. I, I kind of want to ask Corky, you're being so quiet. You're never quiet during these discussions. Did we, did we get- <laughs> Is that a bad thing? No, I, I like hearing your questions. You have smart questions. Um, did we i know mark addressed your you had raised the concerns around deferred maintenance and how does that get factored in and um do you feel okay about where we are with that now and kind of how the core thinks of deferred maintenance well i i i think those are very very good answers to those questions that said it's not a black and white issue either um, so I, I really like the answer in the perspective on the railroad berm, for example, uh, not being deferred maintenance. Okay. But at the same time, we've known the problem for quite a while and haven't done anything about it. So it kind of is deferred, you, you know, so it's, I don't really see it as a black and white, but uh, I think the answers that you provided, Mark, are uh, better than anything else I've heard. So thank you very much. Hey, well, hey Corky. Yes. This is Nancy. So I was thinking about that railroad berm and yep. it occurs to me that we, as we were, we've only really known about it for six or seven years because right. when we started this work with the Corps, we watched them and the railroad go back and forth. You know, the Corps is like, it is a levy and the railroad's like, no, it isn't. Like it was watching, like watching a game of ping pong or something. So I don't think, I think that's when everyone in this area found out that, oh, crap, that's not a levy. And in fact, FEMA has mapped it as if it is a levy. So nobody really knew until the railroad started putting their, putting the hammer down all across the nation. So I think it's important to take that into perspective as well. Yeah, and I was thinking of exactly that too, Nancy. You're, uh, you're absolutely right. And that's why I say it, that's part of that not black and white answer too. And for me, I think the bigger issue here too is, is uh, how we pitch this to uh, all of our ratepayers. really. Um, if, if we have one district that is really upset about, and we're picking on the railroad firm right now, we could pick on something else too. So, you know, um, if we have one district that's really upset about that, that, that could really create some problems as we try and merge these districts together. So I wanna make sure that we're, listening to everybody's concern uh, and that we account for that. Um, and that's where it gets messy. Uh, but again, uh, it, Nancy, you're absolutely right. You know, we really haven't known about the railroad burn for very long. And Mark, uh, really, again, you know, I think excellent, excellent answer to that question for this stage. Um, but I, 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 I'm still concerned about how this um, plays out to the, the, the districts at large. And Corky, I would wanna, so recently as I've been thinking about this and learning more about the vulnerabilities in the system, you know, I, I definitely was with you all on the railroad firm is the big sort of legacy project that we have to sort out. But what we found in this, what we found through the Levy Ready Columbia analysis first and then through the core going even deeper is that there were vulnerabilities in our system that we were not aware of. I mean, we always kind of knew that the FCIC pump station was a problem, that it, it seemed too low, it flooded in 96, like it, it didn't quite meet our needs, but 
the core has really acknowledged that like they didn't really give us what we needed to begin with. They put it too low. It's too small. It's you know they they they've sort of acknowledged it. They also found vulnerabilities in the the levy out out in SEIC that we we just were not aware of. Um, and so you know I think one of the things that that I've been trying to think about as as we hear you all talk about these legacy projects is how do we make sure that that if that is going to be a driver of the conversation that we are actually talking about the right set of projects yeah. and what is truly deferred maintenance versus what yeah. we were given some not great infrastructure to start that we've done an amazing job you know managing into and operating and maintaining but um, it seems like the core is basically giving us an opportunity to try to get it right and so how much does how much does that ultimately matter, especially if by the time we get to construction, when the real big money is on the table, we're all one district? You, you know, and this discussion right here, I think it's a really good example of where we want to get to. Uh, I don't think that just the, the things that we've said that Nancy said, you said, Mark said it just in the past few minutes, uh, we we wouldn't have gotten to that level of conversation a year ago. So this is fantastic. This is exactly what I'm hoping for. Um, you know, in a perfect world, those vulnerabilities would be evenly distributed amongst, uh, you know, from a dollar value amongst all the districts. And we'd say, ah, who cares? You know, it's all the same, you know, uh, but they're not, you know. So um, that's, that's my concern is I want to make sure that doesn't end up blowing all this plan apart. Um, Another way to look at it, I think, is the different methodologies, and that's part of the reason I, for one, wanted us to keep viewing the dollar numbers on the different methodologies um, instead of choosing one at this stage, uh, because there are big differences in that. You know, whether you look at an economic impact, for example, versus whatever, you know, there are really big differences, and I think we will end up with a composite of some sort. I, I'm sure we will, um, but the fact that there are big differences in, in the results, depending on which methodology you use, also points to these potential um, arguments that will come up. So we want to make sure we keep having this very, very healthy discussion of working through these and developing really smart responses, not not one-liners, you know, not not glib ones, but but you know, really um, respectful responses to all those questions. And I. Boy, we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm hearing you say we have uh, many, many more opportunities to share those answers and a need to share those answers with many more people. So I appreciate the admonition and the, uh, the consistency with that. We, we really do have a lot of talking to do still and uh, appreciate your help in, in us getting those answers developed by asking these questions. So thanks. Yeah, and Nancy's request for some bullet points on this, I, that, I, when, when she asked that, I said, good, that's what I need too. Um, yeah. That's one way for us to start working through it as well. So thanks. And I have shared with a couple of the other boards to my desire anyway, and we haven't figured out how to do it yet, but to do um, probably some, you know, what I'm trying to term quantitative public engagement, particularly in the uh, UGB outside of the floodplain uh, where people don't know much about our system. And, and we kind of want to understand where they are and what's important to them. What are the arguments that make sense and are relevant um, so that we can really approach them where they are and give them the information they may need to make a good decision. So more to come on that probably this fall or early winter is my goal. You know, it's an extension of the same issue. You know, here we are trying to get each district to understand why they should be taking on some of the costs from another district. Um, and it's the same thing we're pitching to the rest of the county. Why should they be taking on the cost of these four districts? Um, we all, I, I think there's a really good sound argument, but we're, we're still working and getting, we're making really good progress on refining that, that pitch to the rest of the county. The other thing that I would just plant a seed on, and who knows if it's, if it's, possible, but I have heard discussion at various times that if for some reason we can't make an agreement on one of these legacy projects or one of these bigger issues, um, there's there are ways and mechanisms in the new legislation to think about how certain areas of this new district 
take on costs in the long term um, for some of those specific needs. I'm sure if Janet is on the line, she's like throwing things at the screen because of that. That just sounds so complicated from a financial bookkeeping um, standpoint, but I have heard discussion about like, well, if we couldn't get there, would there be mechanisms so that, and the answer is yes. And I can make a comment on that. Um, so there's a, a terminology thing here that's um, that's getting me a little bit and an equity issue. Um, so if we're talking about deferred maintenance, we're talking about something that was properly designed originally and then neglected, which is not the case of the levies. It's not the case of many of these things. Um, so if we're talking about infrastructure that was not adequately, adequately built initially or has not yet been constructed, then I think it's also important to look at where is that in the districts? And has there been investment in, in some of the districts that is due to socioeconomic power and not in others? And do we want to continue that as we go into the future? Um, so I think that's something that we should, just a couple of issues like ne negligence of, of of maintenance is different than inadequate infrastructure. Yes, yes. And I hope, Nikki, that when those conversations come around, if they actually do come around, that you will be at the table saying that loud, loudly, um, because it is, it, it's 100% true. And the deficiencies or vulnerabilities that Mark and I are talking about with pump stations, and levies, and the railroad firm are not deferred maintenance. They just aren't. We, we might be mixing up the term a little bit, but those were not our responsibilities to begin with that we've been neglecting because we couldn't afford it or whatever. Those were pieces of infrastructure that, you know, it, and on the railroad embankment side, the, that they did it all over the country. They tied these systems to these, you know, railroad embankments that were built of, you know, who knows what, old trestles and dirt from wherever. And, um, and now, you know, the court's having to, to face that kind of in a lot of different systems. So it's definitely not deferred maintenance. And, and, and I think Mark's example of the pump station in pin one uh, and the road berm, that's a really, I, I, to me, that struck me as a really good distinction and pointing out and kind of passing that definition on to the court and say, look, the court noticed this. You know, they consider this as deferred maintenance and this is not. Yeah. Um, maybe we should take on that same uh, perspective. Yeah. There yeah, may really still be some other equity issues we need to wrestle with, but the, getting that one clarified, I think, will help advance the discussion to a more effective place. So I appreciate you engaging in it and helping us tell the story. Yeah, really, really good discussion. Thank you. And uh, I think just with uh, timing here, let's move on to the next agenda item. And uh, Jim, you're up on uh, executive director's report. And my regrets to you, Ken, for having heard this at least once already, but I'll uh, I'll try and make it brief. I do have a few items. That Pressure are on and is to make it better. So. Okay, I'll try. Um, I'm gonna start with an update on the, the new board, the Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District, because I know you guys are uniquely interested and everything we were just talking about is, is keyed to that. Um, we have just inked a contract with Echo Northwest to help us do this revenue development work. And uh, just so you know, I sent an email last night as soon as the contract was inked to the project team saying, now let's go build a more equitable rate base because it's really fundamental uh, that we get that right as part of the new legislation. So we have a, a very large board driven subcommittee. I think some of you are on that board to are on that subcommittee to help guide that project. And we're very excited to be moving on it because the new revenue structure is really key to our ability to move forward and really modernize our system and address the new mandates that the legislature created for us. I also wanna let you know that we have a vacancy on the Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District Board. The vacancy that we are trying to fill was created when Paul Lumley resigned from the board. He has uh, really too much going on and really appreciates the board. So the position we are looking to fill is somebody affiliated with a not-for-profit with expertise about or interest in the floodplain. 
They don't have to be located in the floodplain, but they have to, again, have that expertise. So if you have ideas of people who might be good, it's not staff's job. The boards have to do that themselves. But if you could let Emily Robertson know. Um, Emily, when was your goal to get those suggestions in? Two weeks? I think it, yes, two weeks. And then those will go to Michael Jordan, the chair of the uh, Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District Board, and he'll work with that board. But again, we're looking for people uh, affiliated with a not-for-profit uh, with expertise or uh, interest in the floodplain. So um, the other thing I wanna let you know is we continue to work with our state lobbyists to try and generate some revenue, startup revenue for the urban district. And it looks like we will not be approaching the emergency board, the legislative emergency board. They're gonna be probably focused on wildfire, uh, but we will be uh, trying to move something in the short session next spring. So. We've answered some questions from the speaker's office and we're working closely with our partners and allies, uh, both in the legislature and out to put on a great case for why the state should invest in our startup operation. Um, so that's it for the urban board for today. But again, if you have ideas for people who would be great on that board, please send them to Emily. Um, I wanna give you a quick update on homelessness. Um, we did a, a cleanup near Schmier Road outside of your district, but close by. And we did a coordinated effort kind of following the city of Portland's model where we did a bunch of notification and outreach to people there. Uh, we gave them plenty of time to move their things. We offered assistance in moving their things. And then ultimately we went in with rapid response BioClean and began a cleanup of the site. And we also hired a tow truck company to help us remove some of the abandoned vehicles. Um, the reason we picked that site was we needed to get access to our relief wells at the levee there, and we were successful in doing that. We also established some new uh, Jersey barriers and other barricades that will, with any luck, help reduce the repopulation of that area so we can maintain access. Again, nobody was sighted. Um, we were very careful with people's belongings. We tried to take a very compassionate approach to getting that site cleaned up so we could access our critical infrastructure. The other thing I want you to know is that we are going to be bringing to you probably next month an initial proposed resolution that asserts our authority to regulate the time, place, and manner of camping on our land ownership, but also on areas where we have easements. The reason we are asking you to clarify our authority on this is so that we have a little bit more of a leg up to let people know that our facilities are critical flood safety infrastructure and potholes and other things that occur there really jeopardize our ability to inspect those facilities. They are limiting our ability to access those facilities to conduct normal maintenance operations and potentially emergency operations, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, it will also allow us, once we have that authority, to engage in a pretty assertive signage program. So we will be working with our partners to go out and really sign all of our facilities, including our easements, to say, hey, this is critical flood infrastructure. Please don't dig holes here. Please don't camp here. Call us if you need help. We'll try and connect you with services. Um, we'll also allow us to provide clearer notice to some of the landowners underneath our easements that, hey, we really need you to take action here or potentially we'll take that action and may have to negotiate with you about how we're gonna pay as a follow-up to that action. Again, we'll use that authority very carefully and in a collaborative way, but the truth of the matter is the core is getting increasingly concerned about some of the impacts. Uh, landowners are getting concerned about the impacts. Our operations team and engineers are getting concerned about the impacts. So um, we're gonna need to step up our game and, and do a little bit more work in this zone. Um, in that respect, I wanna say we're getting really good cooperation from the port, from the city of Portland, from Metro, uh, from the sheriff's office. And the most recent example is around pump station four, which is near the big four corners natural area. It's a really critical pump station. Uh, currently RVs and other abandoned vehicles make it impossible for us to get our equipment down into that site to clean the trash rake and to do the maintenance we need to do to get that pump station running by the rainy season. So we've worked with all the appropriate city bureaus to set up an initial plan to get some of those vehicles moved, to do the appropriate outreach to the people who are camping there. And the city is committed to ensuring that we have adequate access to that facility by the middle of September. We're also reaching out to the city of Gresham because they have some properties that will flood if we can't access that site. And while we've been on this board call, I got a call from the Joint Office of Homeless Services who I'm trying to reach out to to increase outreach there. Uh, and again, we expect, we submitted a draft plan to the city uh, just a couple of days ago for their reaction so we can all gather there and make sure we can get that work done. 
The last piece I need to share with you about homelessness right now is that um, the site at Big Four Corners has some illegal activity going on and, and people are pretty aware of all of that. Um, so some of our operations team do not feel safe uh, being near that facility. So we are in initial conversations with the Portland Police Bureau and we've reached out to a couple of private security firms to potentially provide some backup to our operations team, particularly during the, uh, the initial week where they're gonna need to be there for multiple hours at a time to get that facility ready for the fall rains. So um, again, probably some additional expenditures. Um, we're looking at expanding our contracts with the tow truck company, with Rapid Response BioClean, with Cascadia Behavioral Health. And again, we're pursuing options for some security backup for our operations team. Uh, it's not, really fun for me to report that to you, but it's really critical to our ongoing ability to operate our system. And it's really important to our operations team who's really bared an inordinate amount of stress and challenge based on these situations. So I know many of you are out in the community and you may see our crews when they're out performing their work. Um, if, if you happen to bump into one of them, if you could say something nice to them because they've really been working under really challenging conditions and we really want to support them and keeping our system functional in the face of really what's really traumatic to, to be around and to work through. Um, and then lastly, I just want to give you an update on some things going on inside of uh, our organization with your team. Um, one thing I want to thank you for is the fact that you created an equity policy we are now revising that policy uh, for the other districts, and we hope to bring a version of that policy to them in September uh, for consideration then at format later on. And again, you've kind of led the way on that, and equity was very important to me uh, as your director, but it's also part of my interview process. So we're trying to get clear direction across our entire system and give all the boards a chance to weigh in on that. Um, we are also about to initiate a, a comprehensive uh, compensation and classification study for our team. There were a lot of questions coming up about how people got promoted, why they got promoted, who's getting paid what. Uh, we also have some obligations under fairly recent pay equity laws. So we really wanna make our system transparent. We wanna give our employees a really clear shot to advance their career and we want them to be able to understand how and why they can do that. So that will kick off reasonably soon. We also recently completed some anti-harassment training. It was mandatory training. There's a few of us outliers who missed it and still have to take it, but that's set up for us. And we're also gonna be doing some implicit bias training for all of our team members to try and ensure that no matter what kind of person we hire or what kind of people we work with out in the public, that they have a safe and welcoming experience when they're at MCDD or working with MCDD staff. Um, two more things, and then I'll let you be free for the afternoon. Um, we are working as a team to create sort of a roadmap to the transition to the new district. There's a lot of individual projects that people are working on, uh, but my, my sense from being relatively new is that we didn't quite have a shared vision for how we're going to do that and how the finance work implicates engineering and planning and all those things. And since we all really need to work together on it, we're going to spend some quality time as a leadership team and a management team really getting to a shared vision for how we're going to do that and what the highest priorities are for that. And then last, um, we were really excited to welcome people back to campus and let them not wear masks. Uh, but we, of course, have revoked that privilege now. Um, people are still allowed to come to campus, uh, but we're encouraging people to work from home except for our awesome operations team and some of our finance team who has to come in anyway. And for those folks who are coming in, we are again requiring masks and indoor spaces. And we are looking at ways to create more incentives for vaccinations among our team. We are at about 80% of our team is vaccinated. And we are just looking at how other organizations are handling that small gap um, and seeing if we can find some ways to, to give people the incentive to get vaccinated, to keep all of us safe and to keep our operational capabilities uh, real and live through the rainy season. So more to come on that but we're trying to stay abreast of the changing uh, recommendations and doing everything we can to keep our team safe. So uh, with that, oh, last two last things, um, we are going to bring a new monthly financial report to you all. Um, so you should start getting a better look at your finances on a more regular basis. It may not be monthly. Um, apparently we used to do this in the past and it kind of fell out of favor. And uh, we've had some requests from me and from some other board members to just bring that back again. So thank you, Nick. and. Janet for helping make sure the board has all the information about our finances that it needs. And uh, we'll also be bringing contracts um, that are below my delegation or below your authority into my authority 
We'll be bringing you regular reports on how that authority is being used and which contracts are being let using that authority in case you have any concerns about them. So uh, I think I should stop talking now. Thanks, Jim. That was that was a lot. Uh, any questions from the board? No questions, but I really appreciate the thorough update. Great, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll always give me a call. I'm happy to meet for coffee or chat by phone or screen. Yeah, and Jim, and I, I know that houseless issue is very challenging for all the different jurisdictions. The port itself is obviously struggle to maintain access to some of its facilities and and do that in a compassionate way as well but i appreciate your leadership on that and trying to find ways to uh make sure that we're safe from flooding and uh, your staff is safe as well as uh, being compassionate to the houseless individuals um and uh, i think it's going to take multi-agency coordination obviously to, it's a very complex set of jurisdictions um on the you'll bring a draft next board meeting of the the change uh that you're re requesting the board to review if you could send that out well ahead of time for us to read that would be very helpful because uh, i'd love to digest what's being proposed absolutely we'll make sure and you have plenty of notice or we'll uh we'll kick it to ensure you have enough time for review and consideration great Comments, questions. One last thing, and, and I really do appreciate the transparency on the financials. I think as we move forward with the board integrations and all that, and rate, you know, discussions on rates and all that, there's going to be a lot of questions of how the money is spent, and um, like to be very transparent about that. Well, the good news is Janet and Nick and, and the finance team uh, have done such a good job that we're proud to show people our financials, so. Great. Well, any other uh, questions on, on Jim's report? All right, with none, is there any new business? I can tell all, you, all of you are, are just wanting me to give you six minutes back. Uh, with that, no business, uh, I would say let's adjourn. MCDB is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, yeah, appreciate appreciate your service, all of you.